Okay, good um, afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's James Chew. I'm the CEO of iVendi. Uh, for those that don't know about iVendi, um, we are a platform which helps consumers buy and retailers sell vehicles, financial services in an omnichannel world. So I've got 30 minutes to talk to you about connected retailing. And um, perhaps one of the first questions will be, well, what is connected retailing? Bear with me, we'll come on to that in a second. So the story so far, so two years ago I was here, the last time I presented in, a bit of a, in front of an audience, and uh, what's great today is actually seeing so many legs, because I haven't seen any legs for years, I've just seen waists, and uh, it's interesting seeing different heights of people that you've been talking to for the last two years, and you know, Ian especially. Yeah, so, uh, but um, what's been also great about the last two years, and today about seeing legs, is we've proven we can sell vehicles online, and uh, because we had to. Because when you retailers were shut, you had to use your initiative and start selling. So that's great. We've also seen digital disruptors come into the market during this period. And what they've done, they actually have done a good job for the motor trade because they started to normalize the concept of buying a vehicle online. And uh, you know, the huge marketing budgets that both Kazoo and Cinch have has actually helped. So I appreciate they can be seen as a threat, but they're also providing great opportunities. However, I think we all know that vehicle retailing is highly complex and it is the complexities where the problems lie and problems exist. You know, the negotiations, the sale of add-on products, the decline journey for finance, part exchange prices, getting settlement figures. It, to get a seamless journey is nigh on impossible. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the complexities later on. But it is the best technology when you combine the two worlds of, of showroom, the, we'll call it the, the, the analog sales process, and the digital process, combining these two processes together as we call connected retailing. And it's how, they, how can they work seamlessly to provide a great experience for your customers and also a great experience for your team because you've got to work with this technology and, and stop this disjointed process. So let's start with the three types of buyers. I think you're all aware of who they are. So the, the I suppose number three is the in-person, the analog buyer, the guy that just comes into the showrooms, done no research, very rare, hardly exists at all nowadays. We've obviously got the, the advent of the online buyer, the pure online buyer, um, a growing market, but how big is it? I think it's still an unknown. We, we, we're getting figures branded around of, well, it's somewhere less than 10%. And it's difficult to define what this pure online buyer is. We're defining this pure online buyer as someone where there is no contact with the dealership all the way through until collection. And that collection is either at the dealership or it's going to be delivered uh, to home. So yes, Kazoo Cinch is a pure online play, but also dealers are doing this as well. And of course, had to do it during the lockdown. And then there's the most common user type or well, persona is the channel hopper. And that's what we've had for years. Research is online and typically goes in for a test drive and buys vehicle. However, there's more to it than that. And we're gonna drill into that a little later on as well. So where does this journey start? Well, search. So we're gonna to touch on some parts about search and the, how search is evolving. So we've got two types of search, faceted search and context-based search. So you can see on the left-hand side, it's some examples of faceted search providers or sites, so WaterTrader, Stratstone, Arnold Clark, all provide faceted search, which is ultimately a filtering system. You then got holiday companies, all have faceted search. So TUI, uh, Bookie.com, but all of them have faceted search. We then move into the context-based search, where it's free text. And what we realize now is that context search is the norm. That is, that is what you will use every day. You start off with Google, you will then go on to maybe Amazon and buy something. You might pop on to John Lewis to see the latest advert. You may use Curry's and so on and so forth. We're seeing it in automotive, find from my car, hey car, also using context-based search and AA cars use it as well. So, but it is context-based search that we believe ultimately will power your sales going forward. So how does that happen? Well, why would you want to use a context-based search? Well, let's just go through some reasons. So let's think Amazon. Why do you use Amazon? When you type into Amazon, imagine Amazon was selling cars. If you were to type into Amazon, I want an Audi A3, black. What does that mean? 
The first thing is, I want a black Audi A3. It might not be, it might be an Audi A3 black line. It might be an Audi A3 with black alloys. It might be an Audi A3 with a black pack. It might be an Audi A3 with black calipers. So, or maybe black interior. The computer has to interpret that human, and that is the complexity of context-based search. But it, it, it is this relevancy that we all like, because ultimately, you, when you type that in, so the computer's got to interpret and bring back results. So it can be a black line, it can be a black pack. Then we can start to bring in filters. So filters live in context-based search. There's filters on Amazon. But ultimately, it's that free text that we need to start the journey. So and with relevancy, we can just bring back relevant contact. Uh, sorry, this relevant content. And it doesn't have to be um, an Audi A3. It could be a small German hatchback. Customers. Everyone will talk about customers not necessarily knowing what car they want. When they, when they arrive at a marketplace, they have to know what they want because that's the only way you're allowed to search. If we take search starts at Google, Google then can lead. If I don't know what I want, I might go onto a review site, review site, then into marketplace, marketplace, onto dealer website. Could be one of those journeys. So then we start saying, you know, well, I want an Audi A3. Now you imagine the story that everyone's heard of the car salesman that gets a phone call to say, have you got the Audi A3 is it still for sale? And the salesman says, no, it isn't. But thank you for calling, bye-bye. That story's been used a thousand times. That's what faceted search does. It says Audi A3, none, bye-bye. But if you start thinking about what a context-based search can do, it can then start to throw up alternatives. It can be a lot smarter. So if we were to say an Audi A3, we could say we haven't got an Audi A3 in black, but what we have got is a Golf in black. And we've got a Seat Ibiza, and they're all part of the Volkswagen group. So we can start to get very, very smart with alternatives. We then start to get in this insight, because when we see what people are typing, we start to learn. Can anyone in the room spell Qashqai? No, I don't think, no, I, I can't spell it either. It's, it's the most difficult word to spell. So using things like our, the insight we get from this, we can start to see how people spell. We can use those words that they use. We can use them as keywords because if you search on a, on a context-based search and you spell Qashqai wrong, I bet you'll go onto Google and spell it wrong as well. So you can start to, so you can get very, very smart in this world. Insight tells us what do people want? What are they searching for? What do they do? hugely powerful. Then we get on to personalization. This is where we get really cute. Think Amazon again. Amazon really knows what you want. It knows what you like. It's constantly bringing up relevant information. So when we look at personalization, we can start to look at this and how we profile users. Now, we can look at vehicle, lifestyle, lifestyle or a combination of the two. Do you know if you search for an Audi 4x4, We've got a combination of lifestyle search and we've also got vehicle attributes in there. So we can, we can return a Q5, a Q7, a Q3. But once I then start to click through, I can then start to understand. So if I search for a fast car, what is a fast car? Is it in a Bath 500? Is it a Porsche 911? It's the click through that starts us, allowing us to start to augment that customer's profile. And multiple click throughs starts to build this picture of the customer. So if we were, for instance, looking at the, the back onto the Audi A3, and I search on a context-based search on Audi A3 on a group website, then what we see today, and obviously I can see some of the groups here, I, and, I, and I then jump on to the, so I'm on the Audi part of the site, or, uh, and I get an Audi A3. If I jump onto the Volkswagen site, what typically happens? We, we ask the customer to rekey all the information. Doesn't it make far more sense just to return a Golf back? Because that's the most obvious vehicle. If the customer's looking at a trim level, so they're looking at a, an S line, shouldn't we bring back a GTI? This is what you can do. And this is actually one of the things that we do and spent a huge amount of money in trying to build this engine because it, so, it is very, very complex. But then we can start to go even smarter. The amount of repeat information we ask on websites, finance terms, finance deposits, uh, term of agreement. We know it all already. If you do 10,000 miles a year on one site, how many miles a year do you do when you go and visit another website? It's 10,000. It doesn't change. If I've got 2,000 pounds deposit, how much have I got on Autotrader? How much have I got on Motors? I've got 2,000. 
So it's just sharing this data and reusing this data. Think of the, your worst experiences online, and actually they tend to be the holiday websites, because you have to keep on repeating everything over and over again. Wouldn't it be great if that was a personalized experience? We can then, with context-based search, get very clever and we start to look at things like PPC and how we can use PPC. So we're taking long tail keywords, more, more than long tail search terms, so more than three words, then we can get very cute with this. Because what we can then do, instead of using landing pages, which is the most typical thing to do, so we want a, a, an Audi A3 in Leeds, then we could say, we can take the Audi A3 and rip out those those, um, those words, those key words, and drop them straight into the context-based search. That means then if we've only got one Audi A3, we could deep link straight to the FPA, or we could just show all the Audi A3 results. And we look at location, we've said leads, so we can bring back leads. If we don't know your location, we know your IP address. So if you're a dealer group and I've got three Golfs or three Audi A3s, I've got one in, I'm, I'm doing it from here, I've got one in Dudley, I've got one in Durham, and I've got one in Dundee, make my life easier, then I want the car from Dudley will appear first, because we all know that location is still key for the customer. So personalization is a key part. And interestingly enough, we've, we've done most of this work in Germany, which is everyone thinks, well, Germany is a real horrible country with GDPR, but actually, no, it's straightforward. So personalization going forward is going to be key to return the right results and do it smartly and more quickly. Now, we mentioned the, the three buyers. So let's have a look at this buying process. Um, here is a typical sales process, the physical sales process, the, the, the kind of the, the analog sales process. Now, you will all follow these processes, it's just sometimes it's in a different order. Uh, but the bulk of it is like that. Now, in terms of connected retailing, what we've seen is we've taken all those processes and we've adapted them or adopted, we've adapted them to make them online processes. We can't do them all. I can't do the test drive and I can't do the handover. But everything else now we've digitized. So we've, we've replaced, I think see it now we're on earlier, we've, re, we've replaced the, um, I suppose, the, the test drive with a, a digital vehicle, uh, vehicle demo. But everything else now we, we have got either an online or an offline show, um, uh, an offline or a showroom process. And it's the art of this from a technology that makes connected retailing work. So it is seamless for the customer. The customer should be able to buy how the customer wants to buy. So some auto trader research done a year ago um, states, I guess what we would all think, that the ease and convenience of um, get, taking the online route uh, is, was the number one factor, speed of process, ease of comparing deals. What's interesting is the last point, that 23% want to avoid haggling. And this is one of the complexities of buying vehicles, which is, uh, is the killer uh, with, with online retailing. Because how do you negotiate online? When's the last time you did a deal with, with um, Amazon and shipped them on price? When's the last time you tried to put your part exchange in Amazon? And that's where we have the problem. So let's just drill into this haggling a little bit further. For those that have been to one of these sessions before, the last one was two years ago, we did the stats two years ago um, where we looked at all the online prices of the vehicles, then we looked at the transaction prices. This is done on 10,000 paid out finance cases, so I think it's a, a fair reflection of the market sample. So we ran this again in May, so we had to do it when the showrooms were open um, and try to get as normal a retailing month as possible this year. And what we saw is that 28% of the transactions uh, that were done through the platform is where the price offered to the customer online was the same price they bought the car for. So this is an element which could be a pure online play. There was no part exchange involved, but there was finance. So a very straightforward buyer. And that 28% is the real potential for a pure online play because it's easy. However, we then get into where there is uh, part exchange and settlement figures need to be added. We get into price negotiation. So 18% of the deals we saw, it was at a lower price. And more interestingly, 44% were at a higher price. This is typically because of the sale of add-ons. And we're going to talk about add-ons in a second. So 72% of transactions are complex. And systems and processes have got to adapt for that. And that's why it's becoming so difficult. You know, we were aware when Kazoo launched their warranty online, they sold one in the first month. 
But if warranties and add-ons are key to your profit, uh, then a pure online play could be deemed as problematic. So let's have a look at these online buyers. You've seen these little charts before which show you there's activity uh, early in the morning and late at night. Probably what you haven't seen before is so, so when are people buying? And people are buying in normal working hours, which is a little odd. So we only have two hypotheses on this. First one is the concept of sleeping on it. So if you have a look at the activity in the evening and then the applications coming through first thing in the morning as a potential, or probably what we think is realistic is they need a comfort factor. The customer isn't prepared to commit without speaking. And we're suggesting that they are speaking to the dealer and making sure they understand the process. And this becomes very interesting because if I have no customer contact in this pure online play, how do I speak? But as physical rooftops, you have that resource, you have the ability. And we're going to say pick on this a little later as well. So if you take in that same data that we saw above, those buyers that were buying online, what was the dif distance from the dealership? Well, it's hugely increased. It's 50 miles or it's a 100 mile round trip. So Auto Trader, you've, um, the guys, some of the guys are in the room, have, have you launched, um, oh goodness, I can't put the name of it now, the, market, the, the ability to sell cars, help me out. What's it called, market ins Yes. So the ability for the online retailers to start effectively not having a physical location. We, we can sell cars in, in, in different regions and all dealers can do this nowadays. So you don't, you don't have to be a pure online play to be able to sell your cars in anywhere in the country. And with smart PPC as well, if you've got a specific vehicle, you can sell to anybody. But the problem with 50 miles in the UK, it can take an eternity. It's an hour plus, isn't it? Uh, an hour of 15. That's a, that's a two and a half hour round trip to the dealer. So how many times am I going to go to the dealer? Probably either one for the test drive, maybe, but if, I, but if, but if you've done those trust factors and on your website and done a great job, then the customer can knows he's got to write a recourse and can send the car back after seven days, 14 days. So they won't come to the dealership or they may come and collect from the dealership. At this point though, you have no opportunity really to sell face-to-face -face add-on products. And if that is key to your profit center, it does become a big problem. So when we start looking at these finance applications as well that were coming in, one of the things we looked at, it was we looked at Q1 because it was an interesting quarter. It was, it was a month of, it's a quarter of lockdown. And we saw that 26% of the applications that came through our platform, and we process three billion pounds of uh, applications a year. So it's a, it's a lot. So, so over a quarter of them were pure online. 63% that were done in the showroom when you were all short, which is also very interesting. So it was actually saying, well, how is that happening? So they must have been done over a telephone line or there were a few little infractions we have spotted. A lot of PDFs being emailed out and uh, customers filling in application forms and emailing them back. You need to be careful with that from a GDPR perspective. Um, but what was also interesting is this middle one, digital deals. So this is something that we rolled out last April. And this is where you can const construct the deal online with discounts if necessary, with part exchange settlement, with VAPs included in the deal and send it to the customer for them to interact. So we can use in many cases, sometimes it's just used, some, some dealers use it with every single deal and send it and do this way. So it's a pure online play because it becomes very auditable. We, we can help manage elements of compliance around consumer credit. Others just use it for cash customers. So any customer that says they don't want finance, it's them a finance deal. And it's amazing that, uh, you know, there's one of, one of those dealers uh, in here today and they get around about a 10% increased conversion. So 10% of people have said they don't want finance, buy finance through an online method. Bonkers. It's funny when you ask what you will, what, what you will get. So, um, so digital deals accounted for 11% and that's a kind of a new product from our side. So 37% uh, of all transactions were managed online. So huge. Things have fully enough have settled back down again and there has been the shift to the right hand side, which is interesting because we, I, I guess the trade is a creature of habit. Um, but it's a shame in many ways because we've actually proven we can manage more and more of this process online and make a much leaner, cleaner journey, both for the consumer and also for the dealer. So we mentioned VAPs in that process. So 
one of the big challenges with VAPs, and I don't know how, I know some dealer groups are looking to pull away from insured products, um, but for some people it's the lifeblood, it, it, you know, the amount of revenue that can be generated. And let me just give you some little bit of insight of what we found with VAPs. So if we look at what I call traditional online retailing, and you're thinking that's a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, how can it be traditional online retailing? It's all new. Well, traditional would be this linear journey, this happy path of a, I find a car online, I get a, I might add some VAPs to the deal, I might do a finance, I might get a trading valuation, I might estimate what my settlement figure is. That's what we call this linear journey. If we have a look at the VAPs take up rate on that, it's a stunning less than 1%. It's lousy, it doesn't work. And any VAP provider in the room will probably back that up. And it's a big problem. However, if you start taking a, what we call online retailing 2.0, which is where you've got this transaction management, this two-way interaction between the consumer and the customer. And what is fascinating is that when you bake then VAPs into a deal and send them to the customer, um, you get a very different result. So here are two dealers um, both of them are used car dealers, bought high volume, around about 100, 100 cars uh, in stock. So very, very similar. One offers VAPs to every single customer, and every single customer has sent a digital deal. And the average vehicle price is 11,338. The average VAP sale price is 1,216 pounds, so more than 10% of the vehicle value. The second dealer only offers it to 72% of the customers and vehicle price and, and VAT price is the same. What's the output? This is where it gets interesting, is almost a quarter of deals for dealer A, um, sorry, a, a quarter of the deals that were paid out had 1,200 pounds worth of VAT product in. Now we've got hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of dealers that actually just don't even add a VAP into any deal that they send to a customer. Remember the old McDonald's, isn't it? When you say, do you want to go large? Do you want to go large with that? It was 20p. How many people said yes? Because if you don't ask, you don't get. So we're building them into the deal and you get a quarter uptake. But what was interesting was dealer B, because we spoke to dealer B and we, and we asked him, what's your process? And then he said, we speak to every customer and we do a pre-sale of VAP. It's a very light touch. We just say, do you want our customer care pack? It includes warranty, it includes paint protection, and it includes blah, and an admin fee. Um, so, and the interesting part of that though, is that this pre-sale, this speaking to the customer has a huge impact. You know, so we're talking around about 300, what's that, about 380 pounds profit per unit on VAP sales, just by one phone call. And it's not selling, it's just informing. So, a key takeaway from this is if your VAP's penetration isn't those numbers, it is so easy to get into those numbers. And dealer A proves it. You don't do anything, you just load them into a deal and send it to a customer and they'll buy them. So that's the quickest way of making money today. But how do we think this market's gonna evolve? This is the final slide. Um, the, we've, we know about the pure online and we know about the offline and we've talked about the, the hybrid model, the channel hoppers. It's this fourth one that we think now is, the, is going to be the real winner going forward. The big benefit of Pure Online, it's your lowest operational cost. Your showroom sales is your highest cost. So you want to shift more of the solutions online, but you don't want to lose out on valuable income. And I think the previous slide proves that you can make income up, but you need your people. And it is the, it is the benefit of the people, the showroom, talking to customers with a Pure Online, and we call it the concierge service is the way forward. So we have two white papers. One is about search, one is about connected retailing. It should have some copies on your um, seats, but we've got plenty of copies on our stand around the corner if you want to know a little bit more. But, and also we're not, I don't think we can do Q&A, so if you want to pop over to the stand, then the guys are across there, I want to have a chat with you on the stand. But that's me done, and thank you very much for your time.